Hello everyone and welcome to this second chapter of the engine management videos uh, where we are looking at how World War II engines worked and how pilots manage them. So you can understand uh, in air simulators or air games as War Thunder how to fly your plane with full real controls. In the first video we saw how a uh, piston engine works, uh, how a uh, four-stroke engine works, the limits is ha it has, uh, where are the problems at the time of increasing the power of the engine. We, we particularly center ourselves in two particular areas. One was heat and the other one was uh, compression radio. <coughs> if you went uh, over a given compression radio, you will have a uh, knocking. In, and if you try to reach to high compressions, you will have a lot of heat. Now, in this second part, what we are looking is into superchargers and turbochargers, or what is known as uh, force induction. Force induction is a term to describe um, feeding the engine with extra air. Now, one of the things we saw in the previous video was that to achieve maximum compression in the combustion stroke of the four stroke engine, to reach the maximum compression, as I was saying, there were two ways. The first, of all, uh, the first one was to increase the compression radio of the, of the piston. And the second one was to increase either the size of the uh, um, cylinder, so there's more volume in to compress, or to increase the pressure of the air-fuel mixture that comes into the cylinder. Now, it's very easy to say that, and to see, that if you put a higher pressure in the cylinder, at the moment of maximum expansion of the piston, when it's compressed, if you start with higher pressure, you will reach, as well, higher pressures. However, there's a limit to this, because if you have a naturally aspirated engine, which just takes air from the atmosphere, mixes it with fuel and feeds it into the cylinder, you will have a hard limit in how much air you can feed into the engine. Because at sea level, there's one atmosphere of pressure. There's no more. So, in order to achieve higher uh, manifold pressures, you wanted to compress, compress air, then mix it with fuel, and then feed it into the cylinder. Now, the second thing here is that one atmosphere is at sea level. But as you go higher and higher and higher in the atmosphere, the lesser and lesser air is going to be, because atmospheric pressure decreases with altitude. So, if you can reach top power in your engine and achieve the maximum compression radio at sea level, if you don't have any means of force induction, if you are at 5,000 meters, you won't be able to reach even a fraction of that power, because there won't be enough air. Now, this is also closely related with other things we are going to see in future videos, which is rich and lean fuel mixtures. There's a given amount of air you want to feed into the engine, per unit of fuel. So if you feed too much air, there won't be enough fuel to compensate for that. I mean, I have more air than fuel. So when I burn it, I, it's inefficient. I'm feeding too much, too much air. But if I have too little air and I'm feeding exactly the same amount of fuel, it's going to be a too rich mixture. There's not enough air to burn all the, all the fuel. So there's also going to be a lot of problems with that. So in order to balance all these things, higher compression radios, we want higher manifold pressures, we want manifold pressure to be more or less high as we go high in the atmosphere, and to balance the fact that we want to have the perfect balance between fuel and air, the force induction is probably the best way. Uh, well, it's not that probably is the best way, it's that it's the way that it was done. Now, there are two different um, ways to um, fit an engine with force induction, and we are going to see both of them. The first one is a mechanically driven supercharger, and the second one is a ghost exhaust turbocharger. Now, both of them are basically compressors. They take air, they compress it, they feed it into the engine. Now, the, the problem is that they work in different ways. 
First we are going to see the mechanically, mechanically driven supercharger and we are going to see it in detail. A mechanically driven supercharger was nothing other than a centrifuga centrifugator which compressed the air and then it fed into the engine for all the process of the four stroke engine. However, if you have a centrifugator, if you have a supercharger, you want to run it. You need power to run the supercharger. Where does this power come from? Well, it comes from the actual engine. So the engine is actually devoting part of its power um, to not only drive this, uh, the propeller, but there is also a reduction gear that goes to the uh, turbocharger and makes the turbocharger run. So the turbocharger to be running, and it's running all the time because it's hardwired, is mechanically linked with the crankshaft, the tu uh, turbocharger to run needs power. It's bleeding power from the engine. And you are going to say, well, that's bad because I will have less power available for the propeller. Well, yes and no. It's bad because, yes, you are losing some power. But however, given that you are reaching higher compression radius in your in your cylinders, you are achieving higher powers. So you, the benefit is higher than the loss. So we are going to see this in this particular instance. Let's say you have an engine that devotes 50 horsepower to run the supercharger. However, thanks to the super, uh, supercharger, you are winning an extra 150 horsepower that you wouldn't have if you were not running the, the supercharger. And we reach a net um, gain of 100 horsepower. So that's cool. That's great, isn't it? However, as we saw, air decreases in, in pressure with altitude. There's less and less air in the, in the atmosphere. Now, superchargers, they came in very different fashions, and we are going to see them in, in detail. But let's start with the most basic one, which is a single-stage, single-speed supercharger. Now, what do I mean for a single-stage? Well, it's just one supercharger, it's just one centrifugator. What do I mean by one speed? Well, the reduction gear that connects the ground shaft to the supercharger, it's just running always at the same speed. So the supercharger runs as a, at a certain uh, RPM and is available to aspirate and compress a given amount of air by second. Now, the amount of air per second that uh, a supercharger is able to compress and to feed into the engine depends on how fast or slow the supercharger is running. Now, the faster it goes, the more air is going to be able to compress. However, as we saw and as I explained before, if you feed too much uh, air to the engine, it's going to make no, not a difference because you won't be able to use it effectively. Uh, why? Well, first of all, as we saw, you have to keep a proper balance between fuel and air. If you are feeding a lot of uh, air, you need to feed a lot of fuel. However, if you do this and you try to match fuel with air, what you are mm, putting into the engine is very high compressions and uh, you will end up with knocking problems. If you would use all the turbocharger, uh, supercharger uh, air that is coming in, as you go higher and higher and higher there's going to be lesser and lesser air so that's going to be a diminishing problem as you go up until you reach a peak power which is the most efficient power uh, altitude and it's called the critical altitude of a supercharger and at that altitude the supercharger is able to feed the engine with just enough air just enough no more nor less to mix it with fuel and to provide the engine with the top uh, manifold pressure it can achieve without entering compression, uh, entering knocking, sorry. And the problem is that above that altitude, you are going to find yourself with less and less air and the supercharger is running at a fixed speed. It can't go any faster. So you are finding yourself with less and less air and you don't have enough air to run the engine at top manifold power anymore because there's simply no air to, to do that. Now, this is the explanation why when you see a graph of a piston engine plane, you see those peaks 
the cre the well there's more into this of course but basically the engine gets more and more and more and more effective the higher 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 it goes until it reaches critical altitude and then it becomes less and less and less effective the higher it goes now how do you select the altitude you want to be the most efficient at well you simply change the reduction gear between the crankshaft and the supercharger of course if you want higher rpm you need more power and the engine is going to be less efficient at low altitudes because if at low altitudes you are mm, running at high rpms but no you don't need those high rpms you are wasting power from the engine to run the supercharger because you are not getting the top benefits that you would get in the most efficient rpm at that altitude now this basically means that a supercharger is a good thing but it only has a given altitude where it performs at the best and now we can enter the second speed of the supercharger what's a second supercharger speed well it's a second reduction gear and uh, you change gears like in, a, in, in, in in your car you change gears and suddenly the rpms change because you are running with a different reduction gear ratio Two, st two speed superchargers were really common in World War II, were actually the most common ones. Two speeds, what it gives you is a gi a one speed, usually was tuned for low altitude, and a second speed, which was tuned for higher altitude. So you will have two peak power altitudes, critical altitudes. You have two critical altitudes, the first, year, uh, the first speed or blower, and the second speed or blower critical altitudes. Between those altitudes, you will see in the graph, for, for instance, I'm showing right now, you can see that there's a peak at the low altitude, there's a second peak at the higher altitude, but in between, the performance varies. First, you can see the performance is going down, 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 down as you go higher. That's because the engine is still in the first blower. Now, when you change to the second speed or blower, this uh, um, performance starts going up, 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 and up. And it's basically because of the same reason as we saw before. If you are higher than your critical altitude, uh, your engine have, has not enough air to feed into the engine to reach top power. But if you are lower than your critical altitude, your engine is not totally efficient because uh, you have more air than what the engine can actually use. And that's why you can see those peaks of performance. Now, there's a third consideration here. There's another kind of supercharger, which, is, which was actually used by the Germans only. As far as I know, only the Daimler-Benz uh, engines used it which was an hydraulically driven variable speed supercharger. <laughs> this kind of sounds complicated, isn't it? It was actually a complex mechanism, but it's very simple to understand. In that case, the engine had, um, well, was reading the pressure outside all the time. So it had a sensor that, a barometric sensor, that would tell how much air pressure would be just in, in the outside of the plane. And um, depending on the ambient pressure, the supercharger would dynamically change speeds. I mean, it was a reduction gear that would allow for changing the speeds between infinite speeds. So at low speeds, uh, at low altitudes, you will have lower RPM. At high altitudes, you will have higher RPM. And um, that was a very efficient way because you wouldn't have the peaks of performance you have in in the normal two-speed uh, two superchargers because between them you still are the most efficient unlike with the fixed uh, speed superchargers when you are only efficient at the critical altitudes of the engine all right well of the supercharger of the speeds of the supercharger now let's go one step farther we have seen different speeds, but there's a, l a limit to this because, I mean, a supercharger can be just so big. If you make it too big, you are going to use too much power to run it and it's not going to be efficient and y unless you go really, 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 really high. So what's the way to reach incredible 
performance sets really up high in the atmosphere, where air is really, really scarce. Well, with a mechanically driven supercharger, you could do it by putting two in tandem. Instead of doing having just one supercharger, you would have two. Now, the first supercharger would be running at all altitudes. The second supercharger would be kicking in only at very high altitudes. The first supercharger would be of a normal size, a normal diameter, and the second supercharger would be really big. So it could compress a lot of air. And you will run, run them on tandem. What do I mean by tandem? Well, the first states, which run from sea level up to whatever altitude the plane went, was running all the time. But the second states would kick in only from one altitude and higher than that altitude. And once that second stage came in online, what had happened was that the air was fed into that supercharger, compressed there, moved into the first stage, compressed them again, and then moved into the, the engine. However, there is a problem with this, and it's that, as we saw in the first lesson, if you compress a given volume of air a lot, you are going to reach very high temperatures. And you don't want to feed very, very, very he heated uh, air into air fuel mixture into the engine because the temperatures are going to go over the top. So to run this kind of um, superchargers, two stage superchargers, you have to put an inter intercooler. An intercooler was basically a refrigerator which was between both the stages that would cool the uh, very hot air coming from the second stage of the supercharger and feed it into the first stage of the supercharger to be compressed again. And even then again, some models had an aftercooler, which was basically, well, aftercoolers were also used in, in single stage uh, engines sometimes, not always, but some of them had, in, had them, which would take the air coming from the first stage of the supercharger, cool it down again, and then feed it into the engine, so the uh, heating problems would, wouldn't be that big. Now, this is a very effective way, because you have the best of the two worlds. You have a low altitude uh, state, you have a high altitude state, isn't it? So you are going to be using your engine power really effectively, because you're only, you are only using a lot of engine power to run the superchargers at very high speeds, or etc., when you need it, not at all the times. Well, yes and no, it's really, really effective, but it had a problem. And the problem is that the second stage of the supercharger uh, was really heavy. I mean, you needed a very large compressor to run it, so it weighed a lot. The intercooler was heavy as well. That equipment was not necessary if the plane was going to be flying at very low altitudes. So. Planes with two-stage compressors were really good at high, but down low, that was the weight. And the second stage, they needed for nothing at all, and uh, was weight wasted in equip equipment that wouldn't do any good to the plane. So we see again that there's a trade-off here. Still, it was a very effective way. A good instance of a uh, two-stage uh, supercharger is the Merlin the British engine, uh, which was used in the Spitfire, the P-51. So, yeah, we have seen superchargers. Those are superchargers. That's how they operated, that's how they work, and that's the different kind of superchargers that were in World War II. Now, I also said there's another way to do force induction, which is turbochargers. Now, a turbocharger is also, also, a uh, supercharger is, is a compressor, it's a compressor of air. Uh, however, the difference between both is that a turbocharger doesn't work using engine power. It uses the exhaust gases from the engine combustion. They are redirected and they are used to run a turbine. A turbine. The turbine is connected to the compressor and the compressor spins because the turbine is also spinning. They are both connected with each other, with with a reduction gear as well, and the turbocharger is running. So, the advantage here is that you don't use engine power. You are not using engine power to run anything at all. 
you are using the exhaust gases, which were exhaust. I mean, they are not going to be used for anything else, isn't it? Well, actually, this is debatable. debatable. Because piston engines in World War II used exhaust engines, uh, exhaust gases from the engine to provide thrust. They were redirected, if you see, for instance, the calling of a Merlin, uh, those little vents on the sides of the, of the calling are the exhaust gases, and you can see they are redirected backwards. Gases were going out really, really hot and really, really fast, so they provided a slight jet effect that helped the plane go faster. So actually, in a turbocharger, you wouldn't have that kind of uh, effect because all the energy of the exhaust gases, how hot and how fast it goes, is used to run the turbine. So here we see that there's a trade-off. So another problem of the um, of the turbocharger is that it was complicated. I mean, the the idea is simple. And the concept is very, very simple. However, we are speaking about really hot gases here, hot and corrosive gases. So the quality of the materials used in the uh, turbocharger had to be really, really good. You, need, you needed a really good aleation of metals to resist the constant attack of such hot gases going so fast and being so corrosive. Otherwise, the turbine would simply break after not too much. And that's one of the problems and was that was one of the biggest issues with the German turbochargers, for instance. In Germany was probably the most advanced uh, nation in World War II turbocharging in World War II. They had really, really good designs for turbochargers, tur turbochargers but they couldn't build them because they simply lacked the um, raw materials to build them in mass numbers. So actually, the nation that actually used turbochargers in action for the most part was the United States. B-47 used a turbocharger, the B-17 used uh, turbochargers, the P-38 used turbochargers, etc. And they, of course, they could allow themselves to do so because the industrial capacity of uh, the United States and because they didn't have any problems with the strategic materials like the Germans did. Yet another problem of the turbocharger, because yeah, there's another problem with the turbocharger, is that all the ducting you need to do from the engine to the turbocharger itself, all the redirecting of the gases takes space, a lot of space. Also, the pipes and the conductions are pretty heavy, because of course they also have to be done of materials that are going to resist the gases for a long while. So you ended up with a really heavy piece of equipment equi equipment here. So if you look at this picture of a P-47, now look at everything that's below the wing of the P-47. All of that space, all of it, was taken by the uh, turbocharger and the ducting needed to run it. First, the ducting from the uh, engine to the turbocharger itself, and second, the ducting from the turbocharger back to the engine to feed the highly compressed air to the to the engine. So you ended up with a really heavy piece of equipment that, again, if you were flying at low altitudes, you didn't really need. Now, there seems to be a lot of drawbacks to the turbocharger for only one um, advantage, which is it's not using engine power. Now, there's a very big advantage to turbochargers, and that's the, and that they are ex extremely, extremely, extremely effective at very high altitudes. Now, they are much more effective than two states uh, mechanically driven superchargers. First of all, because the supercharger is taking a lot of engine power. That's the first reason. At very high altitudes, you are running two stages of superchargers, and they are both using engine power. So you are using a lot of engine power to run them. In the end, you are gaining power because thanks to that uh, force induction, you are winning raw power. 
However, still, you are using power to gain more power, but the power gain, the net gain, is not that big because you need power to run the supercharger. In the turbocharger, you are not using any power for anything at all. You are just running your propeller for with your engine power. Well, in some cases, actually, there was a, a supercharger in the middle. I mean, the turbocharger was connected to the supercharger and enacted kind of a two-stage supercharger, but with the first uh, second stage being the turbocharger. So you have you will have the turbocharger, then a, su a supercharger, mechanically driven, an intercooler, and then an aftercooler, etc. But when you were running the turbocharger, you were using no engine power, so there is no loss there. So they are really effective at high. And second of all, the higher you go, the less ambient pressure there is. And I'm not going to enter into explaining this, but if you have a, a given pressure of whatever uh, fluid and the ambient pressure outside is lower, you will have the fluid going out at very high speed. For instance, think of a hose, okay, a water hose. If you are just using it to, well, put water into the flowers, for instance, you will see that the water goes out of the hose at very high speed. But now think about taking that hose, moving to your pool and putting the hose in the pool. If you put your hands in front of the, uh, in the hose inside the water, you will see that the water coming out of the hose is not coming that fast anymore because the pressure inside the water is much higher than the pressure in the ambient, in the atmosphere. Now, this is exactly the same. The higher you went, the less pressure would be in the air. So the hot excess gases coming out from the engine would go much, much, much quicker the higher you went. And the turbine was, uh, was able to run more, more, more and more fast the higher you went. So you could reach, reach insane power, uh, power outputs at very high altitudes. And the higher you went, the more effective it was until the limit of RPM of the turbine was reset. At that point, and at that point, the wastegate would open and the performance would start to drop. Now, another benefit of the turbochargers is that they are really heavy. They take a lot of space. They demand for a very heavy plane, so they are not going to be extremely good. The P47 was probably the best fighter, the best piston engine fighter ever. I'm not putting any quotes here. Ever at altitudes of maybe 10 kilometers of altitude. However. Well, a case can be used for the TA-152, but whatever. Um, <laughs> but however, that same plane at low altitudes was really unimpressive from a performance point of view. At, let's say, 2 kilometers of altitude, all that equipment was dead weight. It was not good at all. So, again, you have um, a thing here that is that to achieve the... It was kind of a trade-off. I mean... In, in turbo tires, you would exchange a pretty smooth power curve because you wouldn't have the peaks of the supercharger we saw before. Uh, it would be a rounded performance curve instead of the peaks you can see here. You would ar arrive to that, which is desirable because that doesn't mean widely different altitude performances, mm, and that's pretty good. But you would trade that and the high altitude performance for pretty poor low altitude performance. I mean, those planes at low altitude were simply out of their natural habitat. And uh, yeah, well, I think that's it. I think that's mostly it for this video. We saw what a supercharger is, what a um, single stage supercharger is, what, a, what one and two speed superchargers are, what a one and two stage superchargers are, and what a turbocharger is. This is for syntaxing. It's actually a very simple concept. But of course, when you translate the concept to the mechanical world, this equipment was really, really complicated. Was expensive to, to build, was complicated to run, and was quite complicated to maintain as well. Uh, it required a lot of maintenance work to keep everything in perfect balance for the engine work properly. So yeah, that's it for this video, guys. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you learned something. I hope you had fun. And as always, thank you very much for watching and see you later.